Welcome, tidbits from Thailand. I'm here to tell you a story. A story about my past, but this story can benefit you and those you care about if you care to share the story. It's all about learning. And I thought I knew how to learn. I was very fortunate that my mother started teaching me when I was very, very young. Now, I don't think my mother was particularly a college-educated woman, but she was an intelligent and self-educated woman. And she started teaching me at a very young age to everything. And I guess we started at two years old, somewhere around there. And by the time I went to kindergarten, I could read, I could print in character mode, I could write cursively, I could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. I knew all the states and all the capitals. I had read every Hardy Boys novel and half the Nancy Drew mysteries. I never did really like the Nancy Drew mysteries, to tell you the truth, but I got bored after I ran out of Hardy Boy novels. My parents bought me the Collier's Encyclopedia and the Encyclopedia Britannica. They were middle class and they thought that would be great. And I just dove in and I read everything. So when I went to kindergarten, I thought I knew it all. And compared to the other kindergarten kids, most of them, yeah, I did. Which gave me a very lackadaisical attitude towards school. I was bored crapless. I mean bored. They're, they're teaching these kids, A is for Apple. Showing them little pictures and Meantime, I've been reading Encyclopedia Britannica articles. So all I did in school was screw off. And that went forever. I was never a highly awarded student for good grades. Because basically, they were boring me. And I wasn't going to learn. So the story I'm going to tell you jumps ahead to my last year in high school. And to be honest, my high school was a distraction. In high school, I was driving a nicer car than most of the teachers were driving. I had jobs, including at some point, jobs in factories. And I was making more money than the teachers were, basically. At least some of the time I was. I had my own apartment. Not to brag, but I was just a punk. I was a young punk kid that thought he knew everything. Well, my senior year, I was just trying to graduate high school. Now, I really didn't care about high school. I really didn't. I looked at high school like it was a pain in the ass. But I had this deal with the principal who turned out to be the superintendent of the school systems. Uh, thank you, Mr. Banks. That I could come in, I could just take tests. As long as I came in on test day and took the test, he wouldn't do anything about being absent or tardy. Because I was absent or tardy at least more than half the days of my senior year. But I came in, I took tests. Well, one of the subjects I had my senior year was Algebra 2. And since I had my own apartment, I had jobs, and I had things to do, and I didn't show up half the time, I didn't even open the book. I came in, I took the tests, and I failed every stinking one of them. Failed them all. I mean, I just, I've just been coasting through. And to be honest, I didn't have anybody to cheat off their test scores like I did 
Glenda Gibson in French. So, just telling you the truth, folks. Just honest. But I had a teacher there who ended up inspiring me for my entire life. He changed the shape of my life so much. And he was my Algebra 2 teacher. His name was William McClung. Well, Mr. McClung, he had just gotten out of the military. He was a pilot. He flew military refueling planes, probably the KC-10 or the KC-35, one of those two, depends on what type of time in his career it was. But he flew military planes. He was thin and strong, had a high and tight GI haircut. Now let's turn this back to the stage here, what time this was, okay? This is nineteen six. This is nineteen seventy one, seventy two era. Vietnam was just over with. He had just retired. He had rank. He was an officer, and uh, he wasn't taking any crap from some young, snot nosed punk like me who didn't know which way was up and which way was down. So I really wanted to pass my senior year and I needed his credit. But I, only thing I had was a big fat F in his class. Now, I guess you're wondering how this relates to learning. Well, I'm gonna get to that here in a second. But I thought you needed the buildup of this because I thought I was smarter than all the kids in school because I was doing better than all the kids in school. And I went to, on the last day of the, of the school year, I knew I was going to fail his class. I went to him, punk to man. And I basically asked him, I said, look, I know I failed every test he gave me. Is there anything I can do to get a D minus and pass your class so I can graduate high school, and make mom happy? Because mom's pretty sick anyway. And uh, it'll make her happy if I graduate. And he told me, he says, well, he says, you've got a solid F. I don't know what, what you're, you're wanting here. I said, just whatever I could do to go from that solid F to a D minus. Just get me through the door. He says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got to come into school tomorrow to do some paperwork. I know the last day of school is today. But if you'll come in tomorrow, eight o'clock in the morning, I'll give you a test. And if you pass that test, then I will give you that D you wanted. I said, well, to be honest, Mr. Clung, I, McClung, I, 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 I've never picked up the book. I never looked at it. I can't see how just giving me one more test is going to work. I'm, I'm just, I never studied. I never did anything. He says, well, he says, I'm going to make it fair. He says, I'm going to give you an open book test. And I'm going to give you the tools you need to pass it. Now, don't think this test is going to take an hour. It might take you eight or ten hours. But if you're willing to do it, I'm willing to try to. I said, yes, sir. I'll be there. Because, you know, that's what he demanded. Yes, sir. Anyway, I show up at eight o'clock the next morning. Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and ready to tackle it. And I walk in. And he's got a desk, the little old school desks that you see on. If you were old enough, you know what they are. They were just cheap little desks this big. And 
On the desk, he had five books stacked about yay tall, one on top of the other. And he said, come on in. He said, let me tell you what your test is. He walked over to the board behind him. And we had this big map that went, that would pull down over top of the blackboard. He pulled this map up and underneath, he had a hand-drawn picture of basically, and I'm going to show you an a AI-generated recreation using AI. It's not exactly right, but he had drawn a line on the blackboard. And it looked like it was just a line like this. And on top of the line, he had a square box that he drew. And on the box was written 10 pounds and, I don't know, 6 ounces or something. And then an arrow was pointing down. And he had friction. I don't know, it was 6 pounds and some odd ounces or whatever. 6 pounds, 5 ounces. Something like that. So... Underneath was the question associated to the picture. And it said, an object is at rest on an inclined plane. The weight of the object is 10 pounds, I don't know, 6 ounces or whatever. The force of friction acting upon the object between the object and the inclined plane is like five pounds, six ounces, six pounds, five ounces, something like that. The situation is if the box weighed one grain of sand heavier, the weight of the box would overcome the, the force of the friction and acting upon the box. And the box would slide down the inclined plane due to gravity. Please solve for the following. In degrees, minutes, and seconds, Solve for the angle of the inclined plane. And I read that problem. And wow. My heart just fell straight into my chest. It was like, how in the living hell am I going to do this? I got no clue. And he said, okay. Now, I said I was going to give you a chance, and I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to teach you today how to learn. I'm going to teach you today how to learn. Because learning is not linear. Learning is not linear. Now, there are five books on your desk. From top to bottom, the books are ordered, one through five. I want you to do an experiment for me to convince yourself that what I'm telling you is true, that learning is not linear. I want you to take book number one. I want you to open it up to the first chapter, and I want you to start reading word for word that chapter as fast as you possibly can, read it out loud in your mind. Hear yourself read those words out loud in your mind as fast as you can. If you need to, take your finger and run across the underneath the words so you don't lose your place. Just concentrate on reading it. Now, I want you to pretend in your mind that your teacher just made you a crazy, a crazy 
proposition that said, I will pay you $1 for every word you read out loud in your mind today. Now, I don't want you to try and learn what you read. You aren't here to study. You're here to read the information out loud in your mind as fast as you can. I don't want you to reread any word twice. I don't want you to reread any sentence twice or any paragraph twice. I don't want you to try to understand what you've read. That's important. Do not try to understand what you read. Just read and read it fast. If there's a question underneath, like solve for this puzzle or solve for this problem, skip it. I don't want you to solve problems, create answers. At the end of the chapters, there may be a follow-up quiz of a bunch of questions. Skip them. Go to the next chapter. Read as fast as you can, as if you're getting a dollar a word for it. I want you to read fast. Now, you start with book one. You read every chapter. When you get to the end, start with book two. And read every chapter when you get to the end. Go to book three. If you have to take a break, take a break. But I brought you a slide rule because you're going to need it. You know how to use a slide rule. And I did at the time. I probably couldn't use it to save my life now. But back then... We use slide rules. We didn't have any of them fancy smancy calculators on our wristwatch or on our phone. We use slide rules. They taught us how to do that a couple of years ago. Hadn't used one much. But look, you read book one through five. Now I'll come back sometime around six o'clock tonight. If you should get done early and you want to go get dinner, go ahead, be back here and be here at 6 o'clock. And if it takes you a little longer than 6 o'clock and you're still at it, well, I'll be here. But you read as fast as you can and don't try to learn. Don't try to learn. Imagine you're getting paid a dollar a word. And when you're done... When you're done, if you're successful, I will explain to you the secret to learning. So he left, and I started reading. I read every word fast as I could. Now, I was a prolific reader, always have been. After all, that's why the story began when I was two and I was being taught how to read and was reading the Encyclopedia Britannica by the time I was five. I could read, but I never took the time to read. Why? Because I was too busy, too lazy, didn't give a shit. Sometimes in life, you need your priorities set straight. So I read all this, and I read book one, and I read book two, and I read book three, and it's getting late. I'm into book four. When I get to book five, it's like this bell goes off in my head. I said, wait a second. So I stopped. I said, I think I could figure this out. And I had like a question and I started, I went back to one of the books and I looked in the index for something I needed. I went to another book and I looked in the back of the book of the index for something I needed. And then I tried to, uh, to figure out what was going on. And uh, it was complicated, but I thought I had a handle on it. So I solved the problem to the best of my ability. I wrote the answer up on the board in chalk underneath the problem. At 6 o'clock, here comes in. And believe me, I didn't get this done much before 6 o'clock either. I didn't take any breaks just to go to the bathroom. So he comes in, he looks at the board, and say, congratulations. 
you did it. He said, learning's not linear. I said, but wait a second, sir. This is algebra two. You know, he said, yep. He says, and I want to teach you how just easy it is to learn if you realize that learning's not linear. First off, he said, your geometry was a little bit bad. So we start out with geometry. Then I gave you a textbook on Algebra 1 because you weren't any good at Algebra 1, let alone Algebra 2. Then I gave you Algebra 2. Then I gave you the first year trigonometry book from a college. And then a second, a second year calculus book from a college. So you read through them, and somehow you deduced how to figure out and solve this problem. He said, now, you don't realize it, but you learn every day of your life, and it doesn't come linear. He said, if you go to a movie, nobody's going to tell you memorize what the names of the characters were and what the plot was. If somebody asks you next week about that movie, you'll probably be able to tell them the plot and the name of the characters. But nobody asks you to learn. He said, if I drove you downtown to some place you've never been before and took you to a restaurant, got something to eat. And then I asked you, you to get us back downtown to that same restaurant. He says, you probably, you probably figure out how I get us there. But it wasn't like I asked you to learn how to get it there. You see, all you got to do is read it. Put it in your mind. Put the data in there. Put the information. And your mind's amazing. It will sort this stuff out. Even in, your, even in the back of your mind, you knew you had to solve that problem. So even though you were reading really, really fast, your mind was set, looking for little key things that would be like maybe that'll help solve this problem maybe that'll help solve the problem he said you did this without the benefit of sleep you see sleep is a benefit he said in the military when we go when we were given new planes to learn how to fly they would give us a big manual thick thick as two or three of those books and they'd expect us to know everything in that manual, every system on the plane, how everything in that manual works. And they would teach us, if you want to learn how everything in that manual works, read the manual cover to cover, and then go to sleep. And then maybe do it again the next day or the day after, and then go to sleep. Because you see, learning is not linear. Because teaching is not linear. And that's the secret of it. You see, as skillful as teachers are, or can be, there are just sometimes circular references. You need to know A, and you need to know B. But if they, if they give you A first, you won't understand it until you are exposed to B. And maybe you need C to understand B fully. Now, if they give you C first, you won't understand that. And it won't help you understand A. If they give, if they give you C first and then B, at the end of reading what B is all about, you're not going to understand B because you haven't been given A yet. And there's certain points where there is no best order. No matter what, you need all three pieces of the puzzle before you understand them and how they work together. And no matter what order they give you in, you're going to be confused when you get the first piece of the puzzle. You're going to be confused when you get the second piece of the puzzle. And you're going to be confused when you get the third piece of the puzzle. So the secret to learning these technical manuals 
is read them cover to cover as fast as you can, word by word. Don't try to understand everything. Don't try to figure out problems. Don't do examples or anything like that. And then go to sleep. Take a nap. Because while you're asleep, before you go to bed, just tell yourself, now I sure wish I could understand everything I read today. And while you're sleeping, it's amazing that your mind will say, you snore away, Hannah. But while you're doing that, I'm going to put all these pieces in a better order for you and draw some lines between these dots. It's all like plumbing. It'll come together. You have to draw the lines between the dots. And that's why I say learning is not linear. There's always a different way of teaching you, of presenting the information to you. It shouldn't even be called teaching. It should be called exposing you to the information. Now, I know that there are people out there who literally go out there and they say, I've got to study and I've got to memorize everything. And there are some things I guess you have to memorize. But it becomes easier to memorize them if you can see the entire picture of how they relate to each other before you try this root memory. And one of the things in, in high school I wasn't too good at was chemistry. Because I didn't know this secret first. And I had difficulties motivating myself to want to memorize the periodic table. So when they gave us a test, a test in chemistry, it was like, the chemical symbol for nickel is what? Ni? And oxide is maybe O2? So nickel oxide would be NiO2? Maybe? It's been a long while for chemistry. But then they'd say lead oxide. And I'd say LeO2? No. Lead's not Le. I think lead's Pu. Pb. One, two. It's been a while. But I didn't take the time to read. Now, if I would have had Mr. McClung teach me this, let's say when I was a freshman, First thing I would have did when I went to school was I would have took every book I got, and I'd read it cover to cover, and I'd be done with it. Go to sleep. If I had any issues, I'd read it cover to cover again, go to sleep. And I'd have enough I'd get past anything. Now, you wonder how this helps you later in life. And it's an old story, but you learn things like that. Mr. McClung influenced me to become a pilot. And eventually I became a commercially rated pilot with instrument ratings and commercial ratings and twin engine ratings and all that stuff. And I already was into computers and data. And I noticed something in my flying of planes that the price of aircraft fuel differed from place to place by as much as a dollar a gallon. Now, aircraft fuel in the United States is regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. All that fuel is exactly the same. You buy 100 low-lead gasoline for the motor, that 100 low-lead gasoline in Kansas, the same exact stuff they got in Ohio. So if you've got a place in Kansas like for example, Wichita, Kansas had two different places on the same airport that sold fuel. One place sold 100 low lead on the east side of the field. It was a dollar less a gallon than on the west side of the field. So if you knew that, 
you could just plan to land towards the east if the winds were cooperating and taxi in and get your fuel a dollar a gallon cheaper. Now, in my plane, that would save me almost $300 to fill up. So I decided I wanted to start a business called Flyer Fuel Finder. I didn't know what it was going to be called at the time. But I wanted to be able to create a computer program that would track a route of flight from Cincinnati to San Francisco and it would track it and look on both sides of the route of flight for airports and print out a report that said you can land here and get fuel for this price or you're flying right by this airport and if fuel prices are this and you're flying right by that airport and these fuel prices for this. Well, creating a database of the fuel prices wasn't too hard. But what was difficult was I want to go from CBG to, or actually LUK, Lincoln Field in Cincinnati. I want to go to San Francisco. Which way do I go and what airports are right along the route of flight suitably close to left or right? And what do I know about Lincoln? Well, I know it's latitude in degrees, minutes, and seconds, and it's longitude in degrees, minutes, and seconds. But that's a whole different thing than angle in degrees, minutes, and seconds in a way, but not really. It's somewhat different. So this was back in like 19... 88, 1989, somewhere around that neighborhood. Pre-internet, pre-Google, pre-Alta Vista, pre-any of that stuff. Where we have the Hamilton County Library. And I didn't know how to calculate that stuff. So I went to a library, and I spoke to a couple of librarians, and told them what the problem was and what I'd like to solve. And they gave me about half a dozen books, including one that went back to charting paths across the oceans, which was written in like the 1700s, using sextants and the stars. And I read all the books, cover to cover, just like Mr. McClung forced me to do to get that grade. And by God, I created that company. I created, the, I wrote the computer programs. If you've never thought about the amount of computational power it takes for Google Maps or Apple Maps to map out the whole world and be literally able to take you from this place to that place following every roadway. It knows which roads to take you and what directions they're going and how far it is from this point to that point by this road. The computational power and the mathematics involved to do that is far greater than flying from Lunkin Airport to San Francisco. First off, you would think you, you would plot a straight line. And here's Lunkin, and here's San Francisco. Actually, it'd be backwards probably the way you're looking. Either way. And you just fly a straight line, but you can't. You fly right into the dirt. You have to fly over the curved surface of the earth. That's why on flat two-dimensional maps, when you see a flight of an airplane, they always depict it like going up and down over a hill. Even if it's even if you're flying from a place that's dead west to dead east of one another all on the same latitude. They always depict it as going like this because you can't fly like that. You fly through the 
through the earth in the middle because the earth is curved. So you have to calculate when you want to do that in a curved, um, curved path. And it wasn't easy to do for me. I'd been out of school for a number of years, probably 15 years out of school. By the time I wanted to do this, it was one of the most challenging and productive, satisfying accomplishments I've ever done. It was hard. But I was able to do it because of one thing. Learning is not linear. Now, if you have children, grandchildren, nieces or nephews, uh, and you want to give them a gift that keeps on giving, ask them to listen to my story. And ask them to give it a try. Because I'm here to tell you, this ain't bullshit. This works. Now, don't get me wrong. It helps to be intelligent and have a higher IQ. I mean, if if a person's got an IQ the size of a shoebox or shoe size IQ and has no education and does not read well, this method of reading won't work. But if a person can read and can learn other things, he can learn anything. If he can learn other things, he can learn anything with this method, provided he can read well or she can read well. It works. And you'll give them a gift that will pay them for the rest of their life. If they want to do anything in life, learning is not linear. It's all about being presented the information and going to sleep and letting the mind do its thing. And it really, really, really works. Now, I started that business. It is probably one of the least successful businesses I ever started. The uh, business worked great. Did exactly what I wanted. But I came to find out that most people who own airplanes are arrogant pricks who think they are too good for anything. Yeah, yeah, I literally was selling this one time. And one guy says, I don't give a damn about saving a dollar a gallon on jet fuel. So if I can't afford the fuel, I shouldn't even own this jet. I don't give a damn. And I said, you're either an idiot or a liar. Why don't you just pull a hundred dollar bill out of your pocket, buddy, and just set it on fire right in front of me and show me how big a man you are? Well, that just pissed him off. He was never going to be a client anyway. But that was at, at FBO where I had landed my twin engine small plane and they landed his jet fuel guzzling jet. And it was like he had this cocky attitude that, you know, if I could afford this jet, and to some extent, you're right, because, you know, some of these bigger jets, if you don't fly them, you got a budget of a million dollars a year just to own them. Even if you never even turn, even if you never turn the engines over and taxi them down taxiway, there's so many annual inspections and hangar costs. And, cost to have a pilot and so some of these businessmen who have jets they really truly don't care about the fuel costs they don't give a shit they just don't care so it was my least performing business but i loved it and i used it while i was flying but like i said if you got kids you got friends with kids 
they don't teach this. At least I never had class in school that taught this. It helped me make so much better life for myself. I literally left there with the confidence knowing I can learn anything. Just to have a book. And you know, I want to leave you with one more thing. One more part of this story. It seems like I have heard from multiple people who interview successful people. And one trait that seems to be common, very common amongst successful individuals is they read. They are constantly absorbing other knowledge whether it's from reading or audiobooks now or YouTube or listening to podcasts. Used to be only reading, but that was back when we used to only have libraries. So successful people absorb information. And like always, I'm taking my time to make this video for the 100 people who will probably watch it, hoping that karma will be passed out and some young individual, whether they're 12 or whether they're 22 or whether they're 32 or 40, somebody will learn this method and try this method and hopefully this learning technique will change someone's life. It will make someone more successful than they ordinarily would have been. That's all folks.